All right. Welcome back to Context and Clarity Live. I was going to say in our new time, day and time slot, but it's, I don't think it's new anymore. I think we've we've crossed that that uh, that line. I think we're this is just our day and our time slot. Welcome back. The new normal hit fast. It yeah. is. It is the new normal. That's a great way to put it. So, Katie, welcome back. Glad you're here. Um, I see Scott Thrift is joining us from LinkedIn over uh, uh, in San Francisco. Hazy day on the San Francisco Bay. Big shout out to Scott Thrift because he picked me up at the airport last week um, when I flew out there for the AIA National Conference. So thanks again for that, Scott. Great tour guide, great friend out there in San Francisco. Mark's joining us from Waxhaw, Sunny Waxhaw, um, North Carolina. Glad you're joining us from Facebook today. And uh, which is a good reminder, because if you are on Facebook right now and you say, hey, why, why, um, why is my comment not showing up the way Mark's did? Well, it's because you probably need to give permission to let your name and your likeness and your comment out. So there's a URL in the bottom left hand corner of your screen right now. It's chat.restream.io slash FB, as in Facebook. A couple of clicks later, you will give Facebook permission to... Uh, let your comment out like Jessica's has. Jessica, welcome back from Los Angeles. She said, Scott Thrift is a gym. All right. He's not a gym, he's a Scott. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, dad jokes going on there. But uh, but glad to have all of you joining us today. We have a, a great guest and a great show lined up today. We're just talking before we went live. Uh, Katie has an interest. Uh, because of her background and our guest today. And she learned of an opportunity uh, in her area before we went live today. Maybe we'll talk about that here. I don't know if she's gonna jump on it or not, but uh, uh, we're gonna have a good conversation today with a return mm -hmm. guest. So um, welcome, glad that you're here. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here. Let us know where here is for you. Uh, if for for uh, some reason, I don't remember where in the world you are. It's great to have you here. And uh, just want to say hi. Just want to welcome you to the conversation. As I said, my guest, or not my guest, my co-host today is Katie Kanga. She's in Minnesota. Thanks for joining me again today, Katie. How's everything in Minnesota? It's warming up. So it's finally not winter, which is nice. I All know right. I was going to ask, like what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah. What, what does warming up mean in Minnesota today? It means my four-year-old cries when it's over 80. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> she wants it to be winter again. <laughs> All right. So she loves winter. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Good for her. Uh, well, you better keep moving north, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> oh, boy. 80. Mark Inns, welcome. Get the thumbs up there. Glad mm -hmm. you're here today as well. Okay. Um, have we forgotten anything? Do we have any? I don't think we have any real housekeeping today, do we? Not too much. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're, we're jumping back into things. We took a week off last week because of the uh, AIA conference. And so we're jumping back in and we're going to apparently be joined by dogs here <laughs> for a second. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to mute myself for a second. Okay. Well, great. Um, Jeff, you've never handed off the beginning before. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Maybe maybe that's yeah. the uh, maybe that's the extent of it for now. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't we just go ahead and jump in and let me introduce our guest today. Our guest is an accidental archivist and a Hepcat audiophile. A trip to falling water led to a late night Google search, which led him to be a founder, which led him to be a director, a tour guide, and a cast host. He's a modernist soul trapped in a modern body and the purveyor of the largest open digital archive of residential mid-century modernist architecture in the world. He's no Mr. Rogers, but he is Mr. Modernism. George Smart, welcome back to Context and Clarity Live. Hey, thank you. Wonderful to be here. It's so great to have you, have you here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Now, are we going to talk architecture today, Jeff? Yeah, no, we could. Okay. Well, I need to change glasses. And get on <laughs> the correct <laughs> yes. glasses for the topic. Thank okay, you. Now I was we feeling it properly. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I was feeling disoriented there for a yeah. while. So thank you for mm -hmm. doing that. It's much better. It's better indeed. 
Well, um, definitely welcome back. Glad that you um, are joining us again. When we were talking about, you know, leading leading up to today, one of the the topics of discussion, of course, was last time we talked about your archive and we talked about all the houses and certainly we could talk about the the house in Minneapolis. But one thing that we didn't touch on as much last time you were here, I know it's a focus of what you do, is tours and events. And it's great timing because many of us were out in San Francisco. You were included uh, out in San Francisco last week traveling. A lot of us probably went around in architecture, pulled our cameras out, took pictures of architecture. So architects love to travel. They love to travel for architecture, and you're facilitating some of that now. So um, that might be a great jumping off point as well. But why don't we start with the predicament that Katie is in now that she knows of the opportunity in Minneapolis that you told her about earlier. What's what's going on? What's for sale in Minneapolis now? So I was telling Katie earlier that uh, just recently, uh, one of the first houses by uh, Minnesota architect Elizabeth Close has gone on the market. It's an astonishingly well-preserved modernist house built about 1938, and she should run over there and see it. Probably should. Um, it's awesome that you're a pseudo realtor in that you have an <laughs> ear out for all of these properties. Well, actually, you know, the realtors look out for us. We hear from dozens of realtors all across the country all the time, letting us know when a house becomes vacant or when it goes on the market, because vacancy is really the point of preservation. You can't wait for these 11th hour stand in front of the bulldozer campaigns and expect them to be successful. You have to wait till the little old lady dies and then the heirs start fighting over the house. That's the time to intervene and keep the house occupied and give those heirs strategies to see if they can keep it intact. And it's interesting to focus on modernist because we're in that cycle right now of those 50 year old plus properties starting to go and actually, I should ask, um, how do you define modernism? So for our purposes, we have four characteristics. It has a flat or a low pitched roof. It has an unusual geometry. It has an above average number of windows, openings, courtyards, atria, et cetera. And finally, it has an open floor plan, which is no big deal these days because pretty much every house has an open floor plan. But uh, back in the 30s, that was radical. So what do you call the architecture that's after that? Uh, well, you know, there hasn't been much after that. There hasn't, there's been a little postmodernism, right? But that mm -hmm. was mostly in um, commercial buildings as opposed to houses. You still have people wanting their colonials, people wanting their Cape Cods, people wanting their ranches, uh, things like that. But the interest in modernism, surprisingly, has surged over the last you know, 10, 15 years. Um, a lot more developers are picking up modernist things for their residential developments, which really didn't happen before, except in a few places. So when you hear about some of these properties going out, do you ever make a special trip to see them while they're vacant? <clears throat> uh, that would put me on a plane all the time because we get about 10 a week. Wow. But we do try to put them in our newsletter, which people can get and uh, that goes to a lot of people around the country, about 32,000 so far. Cool. That's a lot. And for you, this all began, as I said in the intro, it began with the trip to Falling Water, right? Right. Um, I fell into this as just a, a mere mortal, non-architect, uh, non-design person, went to Falling Water, which is Frank Lloyd Wright's epic home in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. And most people know this house. You can look it up. It's stunning. It's, it's great in photos. It's great in videos. It's great in 3D renderings. But nothing really matches going there and seeing it and experiencing this space. So I went and just it short-circuited my whole central nervous system. I came back, flew back from Pittsburgh, which is the closest airport, got home about 6 o'clock, just couldn't get this thing out of my head. So I did what any rational person would do. I went to Michael's 
the supply store and bought some styrofoam, an X-Acto knife, and some pins and decided to build a model of the house that I wanted to have one day. And it was a terrible model. I mean, it worked well enough. Uh, I could, you know, slice things with the X-Acto knife and pin it all together. And then a month or two uh, later, I took it to an architect that eventually designed my house. And he said to me, George, uh, this is not how architecture works. We make the model for you. <laughs> it sounds like it worked out okay. It did. I've been in the house 12 years. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Congratulations. So, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. It, it, I mean, that's a big dream, right? For for many people to design their own home or, or to have their own home designed for them. So that's, that is quite a big yeah, dream. Yeah, most people don't look into it because it is not the easiest thing. Um, you know, what's easy is stopping by your local sales trailer where you've got realtors abounding and lots of things to look at. And you go in and 15 minutes later, you're signing a contract for a house. That's the easy route. And that's why it's so, it's, it's so popular. Um, but there are ways to make it easier for the average person to do it. And the first step is to understand that you can have a modern house without spending a fortune. Uh, the magazines make them look very expensive. And some of them are because they're all blinged out. But the basic construction cost can sometimes be very comparable to traditional houses. And the bonus is you get more square footage because they're better designed. Yeah, that's a really great point. So you, so how old were you when you, so that, that was only 12 years ago that you went yeah. to Falling Water to have that right? Yeah. So you're an adult. Um, and, and, you know, obviously the impact of going and visiting Falling water in this case was was immense on you. Um, many of us, when we were in architecture school, we had a, a field trip or multiple field trips every year, and you went to some city and you saw these things, or you traveled abroad to see these things. What is it about traveling that, or maybe maybe does traveling? bring bigger impact you know is it is getting into a different environment seeing things that we have never seen before but what is it that, that gets us hooked on these travels and say hey i want to go to this city or i want to go to see this building because a lot of people say hey i want to go to the beach or i want to go to some festival or right but most of us right now i think in this audience go oh i would i would like to go to falling water well i mean the buildings are something that you think about if you're into this you know just like if you go to a nascar race you want to find it like where are the drivers coming from and can i go talk to some of them and where are they hanging out so with uh with our travels uh with our organization we tend to go to things like the aia which i was at recently we go to modernism week every year which is in palm springs uh, we were just up at New Canaan, Connecticut, which is a little epicenter of modernist houses for the Philip Johnson Glass House Party up there. And in all these experiences, you can go and get a visceral experience of what a house or a building is like that you can't get from some other method. And I think that's important because whether you're an architect or not, understanding the vibe is really you know half the battle. Those people that hate modernist houses and think they're ugly and detached and weird and even communist have never spent a night in one. <laughs> yeah, any of the houses I've seen in that category, the there's such mindful casework and build-ins and just the way it is, it's not something you picked up. It, it's designed for the space. It was built in the space. Right, right. It's just more efficient. You know, that's the thing. I, I tell people, because the, the biggest question I get asked is, why should I hire an architect? Why should I spend all that extra money when I can just go pick something off the shelf down the road? And the answer is, is that let's say you want uh, 3,600 square feet in your house. If you go to an architect, you can probably get them to design you a house that's 2,600 square feet, but lives as big as a developer house is 3,600. That saves you a thousand square feet of money, which is considerable, way more than the architect's fee is gonna be. Yeah, that's a great point. 
So welcome to this edition of Why to, Why to Hire an Architect. This is our, our commercial on, on hiring architects. But I, I think that's I, I think that's a really it's an important point. Um, in Katie, you use the word mindful. I think that's that's a great way to put it as well. It's everything designed for a purpose and, and a fit, et cetera, you know, and matches a certain extent, uh, certain aesthetic. Um, yeah, I think all of those things are important. Have you have you ever done a tour to Columbus, Indiana? George? We have about six years ago. We took a group okay. there. Uh, Columbus is a town that basically grew up over the last sixty years as a center for architecture because Ingersoll Rand, CEO, told people, "If you'll hire an, uh, an internationally known architect, we'll pay the fees." So churches, the fire station, schools, all kinds of buildings took them up on this offer, and all of a sudden you've got world-class architects building in this little tiny town. So now you can drive around and just see a huge number of, of projects there uh, spanning the last 60, 65 years. It's a great weekend trip. It sure is. It's, it's uh, 60, about 60 miles south of where I am right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anybody outside of Indiana calls it the modernist architecture capital of the world, but we do. So, yes, oh, absolutely. Um, and they have uh, lectures and special weekends and um, all kinds of things down there. Yeah. When uh, Indiana University, which has no background in architecture education, they decided to launch a Master's of Architecture program rather than having it on campus in Bloomington, which is not too far from Columbus, um, they actually uh, set the Masters of Architecture program in Columbus, uh, which makes a you know makes a lot of sense. Just being surrounded by um, by all those projects, I mean, so many Sirenins and and others there. It is you know I guess that's this is the Chamber of Commerce plug. We've gone with architects and we're going to Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, if you have it, have the opportunity, you should check out Columbus, Indiana. Um, what's What's on on the uh, uh, on the docket for future tours with U.S. models? Uh, well, we just got back from Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, last year, we were in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Uh, next February, we'll be back in Palm Springs, which you do every year, and then the following May, we'll be in London, Brussels, and Amsterdam. I was just going to ask if you went international because yeah. that's where some of like going to Iceland and uh, Turkey and some of those places, they have beautiful stuff that we, again, in small towns, you find these little gems of churches or um, geothermal baths that are just so well designed. My big challenge is how do you find these? Um, when just starting to look around, I, I would love to find these architectural gems, or even if I see something, I don't know who the architect is. Well, you know, um, that's what we have the internet for. I mean, it, somebody's figured it out most of the time for any commercial structure, whether it's operating or abandoned. There are hundreds of sites just for abandoned buildings around the world, uh, particularly in the Eastern Bloc countries where you had the Soviet brutalist concrete buildings built up over the last 50, 60 years that are empty now, but were designed by architects. So, that you know, incredible. the information's out there. You just kind of hunt a little bit. Yeah. So how do you decide where you want to go or where the next tour is going to be? Or are those the same? Uh, well, we've been running these tours now for almost 10 years internationally. Um, we know that people want to go to a certain city just because it's that. Like, everybody loves London. Yeah. Um, some cities are easier to navigate than others. For instance, some have a lot of modern, some, some don't. Also, we want to provide people uh, experiences that we know that they will think is really cool, but aren't architectural. Like when we go to London to Brussels, we take the Eurostar train underneath the English Channel. Everyone loves that experience. When we're in Norway, we take the train from Oslo to Myrdal which is a train station in the middle of nowhere with nothing around it and no people. It's like you've landed on the moon and the train lets you off and leaves. And you're in the middle of these mountains with no people, 
no houses, nothing but tracks. And then about 10 minutes later, little tiny train comes puffing in the station and takes you to this gorgeous fjord where you spend the night. Nice. That does sound like quite an experience. Are, are most of the people that take your tours, are they architects or are they no, just a wide uh, maybe 5% are architects. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we're, we're an organization for the fans, really. Yeah. People who, who so, love this stuff, but it might be their ninth or 10th priority in life. Got it. Got it. So, you know, most of our audience being architects, yeah, I can sort of imagine how they're traveling, right? And what they're, what they're doing when they travel. Um, but I, I kind of think even though the majority of the people in your tours are not architects, I suspect that they have, uh, because they are, you just, you just describe them as fans and that's maybe what sets them apart. Um, my guess is they're doing similar things because I think that the folks in our audience are probably um, fans when they go on these types of tours as well. What what are the what are the favorite activities? Are people sketching or drawing or photographing? Oh, or no, 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 all of it. No, no, <laughs> drinking, no. Okay. eating. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sketching is for design people, right? Okay. You know, the average person is not going to be sketching. They're going to be like shopping, right? Um, they're going to be, you know, bouncing over to meet their friends from 10 years ago at dinner someplace one evening. Okay. Um, it, it's a more, uh, yeah, more sort of normative set of activities as opposed to the more scholarly things you might do or the questions that someone in the profession might ask of a guide, for instance. Got it. Got it. So for those of you that are in the audience right now, what I know many of you did go to San Francisco, not everybody, but um, to think about the last trip that you went on. Maybe it was specifically architecture related. Maybe it wasn't. But what do you like to do? Um, how do you experience cities and and uh, these places where you go? I'm curious to see what people put in the uh, in the comments here. I did see some photographs from San Francisco of architects sketching. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Which is right. It's the they have, they have workshops on this at San Francisco. They do. <laughs> they really do. Yeah. Urban, urban sketching. And I saw pictures of people taking pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that has made us successful is, is that we make architecture fun. Um, architects don't make architecture fun. They take it very seriously. So seriously, in fact, that the public often doesn't want to do things with architects because the language is unintelligible. You can't tell what they're saying half the time. And, and they're so deeply riveted into it. You know, what's funny is, is that the AIA every 10 years goes through this existential crisis where they wonder why the public doesn't like them more and why they don't you know, understand uh, what architects do and the value of architecture and all that kind of thing. And so... What, the, what they do is they form committees. And these committees, it doesn't matter whether it's the 70s or the 90s or the 2000s, they always come to the same conclusion. We have to elevate the public and educate them about what we're doing. And that is wrong, wrong, wrong. The public, I tell you, does not want to be elevated. They want to stay on the ground floor right where they are, and they want you to come down on, on your elevator to them Give them a little bit of information and a martini and they're happy. I think that is so what's so challenging is that there is so much around architecture that we could talk hours just about HVAC systems in one of yeah. these modern systems. Oh, like, yeah. That doesn't necessarily make for a pleasant tour. So yeah. like, that <laughs> choosing those little bits um, is, is a skill that a tour guide needs to have because there's so much information you can be giving folks. Right. Now, you know, the AIA and several other organizations run tours just for architects. And, you know, and you'll be in the Sistine Chapel and you won't be looking at the banana. You'll be looking at the cooling system in the Sistine <laughs> Chapel. So, you, you know, it's something for everybody. Yeah. Do you ever do architecture specific tours? I'm guessing. No, not. uh, I mean, all our tours feature modernist architecture. That's the central draw. But we try to get people into a lot of private homes. 
We try to have them stay in modernist hotels and experience those, go to as many of the iconic places that we can get into. Um, one of my favorite in Brussels is the Atomium, which is kind of like the uh, unknown sister of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, the Eiffel Tower was built for a World's, World's Fair, right? Well, in 1958, the Atomium was built for a World's Fair. The Atomium is a giant model of an atom it probably stands 15 stories tall at least. And each of those balls of the atom is probably 150 feet across and they're all connected by these giant uh, escalators that take you up into the elements of the atom. It, you just look it up, it's the Atomium in Brussels. And, and that thing is just amazing. And it's all about the atomic age, 1958, when modernism was at its zenith, I mean, Magazines during that time were 300 pages a month of rock and roll modernism. All you could eat, baby. So what? So what's changed? A lot has changed. A lot has changed. Well, modernism fell out of favor in the 70s for a number of different reasons. In the residential sphere, uh, modernism was always ahead of material science. So houses are being designed that really couldn't endure a lot, particularly with certain things like leaky roofs. So the roofs that were for flat houses began to leak. And of course, when the realtors heard that, they started discouraging everybody from buying or building flat roofed houses. So that almost went away until the 90s. And um, then they started to come back and you had um, uh, some key houses, like one of them was the Kaufman House by Richard Neutra in Palm Springs, went through a considerable renovation, basically to recover from Barry Manilow, who had uh, not known how to keep it when he owned it and filled it full of Laura Ashley. You can imagine Richard Neutra and Laura Ashley and a shotgun marriage. It did not work at all. But now the house is a showpiece of modernism. I love that. <laughs> and a shotgun wedding. Yeah. Um, so your organization is U.S. Modernist, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, t tell us a little bit more. Obviously, you're you're promoting um, modern residential or modernist residential architecture. What's what's the what's the big goal? So we are a nonprofit, and our goal essentially is to keep these things from getting destroyed. That's it. And in order to do that, we have innovated certain things that I thought, surely someone has done this already. Turns out, not so much. So we have three main features on the site. One is we've documented 20,000 houses so far. Basically, every house by every famous modernist architect you could name, including some of their unbuilt work. Uh, secondly, we have an architecture magazine library with 4.2 million pages uh, going back 130 years. So every issue of any magazine you ever studied in school, we probably have it. And it's text searchable now for the first time because we scanned it. Nice. So if you're working on a project, say you're working on the Elizabeth Close house in Minneapolis, Minnesota, you could go in and find original photos of this house, interior and exterior. And what's better is that we have the whole magazine so you can find the ads that were in there at the time about the fixtures and the you know refrigerators and heating and air conditioning and doorknobs and whatever it is that you need was being advertised at the time. So people who are doing restorations think this is great because they can look up these companies or brands and see if they're still in business or see if there is a secondary market like on eBay and get stuff for their project. That's amazing. What's your, what's your favorite, uh, this is probably like asking about your favorite child, but, but what's your favorite modernist house in the United States that still exists? It still exists. Well, um, I tend to like small houses and by small, I mean like under 1200 square feet, like really small. Um, mm -hmm. one of my favorite to visit and I am there every year is the Frey house in Palm Springs which is uh, 800 square feet. It's located 
it's built on a rock. The rock comes up into the living room uh, and gives you this 300 degree view almost, maybe not 300, I guess it would be more like 210, of the whole valley and the airport. Um, and the house is not available to tour generally, except during special events like Modernism Week. So uh, mm. this is like one bedroom, um, one little kitchen, one sitting area. Um, you know, the only drawback to the house really is that in Palm Springs, it can be like 120 in the summer. And, and it is really, really hot up there in that house, even with some air conditioning. So I'm not sure I would want that particular house to live in, but it's really one of my favorites from a design perspective. And Albert Frey is kind of the patron saint of architecture of town. Uh, and they are putting together a uh, major exhibition on Frey, which will open up early next year. And you'll have a tour there, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's in cool. February for Modernism Week. Yeah. So if that's your favorite house, you mentioned certain cities are easier to tour than others. What are your top three favorite to tour? Um, I like Los Angeles a lot because there's so much to choose from in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles loves its modernist houses particularly. And it has uh, an endless supply of modernist museums and schools and office buildings and every possible structure that there is. So if you, if you want to see it, and there are guidebooks that have been published on LA for decades that you can pick up and just drive yourself around and see all these things. Uh, a number of them are open to the public, either all day, every day, or by appointment. Uh, for instance, the Eames House in Pacific Palisades by Charles and Ray Eames. Most people don't know that Ray is not his brother, it's his wife. And they were very famous for uh, design in general, industrial design. Their famous Eames chair is still being produced today. A lot of people who come on our tours live in just kind of a normal looking house, but they have that one Eames chair. Eames chair is the gateway drug of modernism. You you buy one of those, you want to have a house one day. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, so, okay, so <clears throat> your, your favorite cities, um, your favorite house, what are your favorite uh, accessories? Maybe it's maybe it is furniture, maybe it is appliances. But as as you go around and you see these, and I assume that many of these homes that you tour are are basically period showcases. So, um, you know, you think back across all of these years of refrigerators and bookcases and chairs, and where where was the best design? Um, of that era, where was it coming from? Well, um, I mean, this this was this was a big movement that had influences from the U.S., influences from Europe. I mean, we could do a whole four year degree program just on this one question. But for the average person, it really boils down to like certain features that came up. You know, for instance, uh, back in the day, uh, radiant floor heating was like the Bitcoin of architecture. I mean, it was so new. <laughs> and so sexy and are you going to pump this water through your concrete floor through these little pipes and it was going to you know keep you from having that old coal heater and that old oil furnace that you were going to have to burn this was going to be fantastic and it was for a while until they broke uh, most of them did not hold up um, that was kind of cool and then when um, you had different kinds of built-ins so one of the uh, novel things of that era was the drop down turntable. So there'd be a panel in your wall and you'd pull it and your turntable would come down like this. For those of you who don't know what a turntable is, it played these vinyl discs and made sound come out of them. Um, vinyl is coming back, I'm glad to say. And, uh, and, this, and this thing was called hi-fi for high fidelity. And you would hook this to what at the time were gigantic speakers also mounted in your wall. I mean, today we have speakers that are like this big, you know, work off of one bolt. Well, the speakers of that day were like a foot by two foot and you had subwoofers and tweeters and mid ranges 
and you put them around your house and they'd be enormous and they would last forever because speakers don't break. But that was something that people loved to see too. And then the, it was repeated when television came along. And so then you'd have these panels that open up and show your big TV, which was a giant cube, like three feet by three feet, like the size of an oven that would sit in there. And there was no cable, there was no streaming, there was no Comcast, none of that. You had an antenna on top of that thing that you would have to hold at a certain angle during the football game to get any kind of reception at all. And the, the biggest thing that came along too, along that lines was when we had remote control. You could actually instruct the TV to do things with this handheld device. That was, you know, stunning. Another feature of these houses, more structural, was terrazzo. Uh, people love terrazzo floors. Uh, beautiful, easy to clean, uh, last forever, hard to break. Um, they're coming back too. A lot of people are choosing terrazzo now. And terrazzo never lost its allure in airports. If you go through most airports, it's all terrazzo all the time. I was going to say, you know, when you're talking about the turntables, if anybody needs an example of vinyl, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. just, which, which album do you want? Yeah. Uh, I just I got, I was given an album by one of our musical guests recently. Uh, nice. And I don't have a, a turntable. So I went on yeah. Amazon and bought one to play my one album Good. that I have now. <laughs> and I bought one of these sort of knockoff turntable cassette things from... I think wish.com is like $3. It'll probably last me yeah. a week, but it played, <laughs> it played the album nice. just great. Nice. I love it. Yeah, this, so you, you bring up your show, you, US Modern's Radio, which is, it's a fantastic, I, I love the storytelling. This, and so if you've never listened to US Modernist Radio before, it's stories about the houses, right? It's, it's not this, you know, well, this many square feet, you know, so it's not like a realtor giving a tour of a, of a, a house on, uh, that's on the MLS. It's on the, uh, uh, that's just come on the market. It's stories of the houses themselves, which I think is amazing. And of course the, the human interest around it. Um, and then as you said, musical guests. Yeah. So tell us more about us modernist radio. So we started the podcast, uh, just to, to have some fun with architecture try to make it more accessible to the general public. We want to have guests on that were not necessarily experts in something, but could talk knowledgeably in a way that the average person could understand. Um, about four years into it, I would notice when I went to parties at these houses, they were playing jazz in the background. Um, you know, Frank Sinatra and uh, Dave Brubeck and others. And um, so I thought, well, you know, um, we got some jazz bands around town. I'll ask one of those to come over, see if they'll do it. And they did, and it was great. And so now we have uh, musicians from all over the world come on the show and, and perform for us. And they have interesting connections to architecture and design. And then one of our ongoing features is we've interviewed probably 30 children or grandchildren of famous architects, like uh, both of Richard Neutra's sons, uh, Rudolf Schindler's grandson, um, Frank Lloyd Wright's grandson, um, Norman Jaffe's son, and, and they tell stories of the architect as people and what it was like to grow up with them. Uh, the two Saarinen children, you know, Ero Saarinen was, was very famous during his time, but he had a pretty wild personal life. So we got to hear those stories. I, th I think that's, again, if you have not listened to U.S. Modernist Radio, uh, you're missing out uh, because of uh, of all of those things. And, and just the, and, I, you know, you, you spoke before about how architects could connect with the general public. And, and you know, what you were just talking about really reminds me of the same thing, right? This is the human connection to architecture, which is ultimately the most important. Yeah. Right? I've got this, I've got this structure. What does it mean? You know, what does it mean without the, the thing that goes on, the life that goes on inside of it? Maybe it's a sewage treatment plant. Maybe it's a, a residence, who knows? But, but, um, 
you know, it, it's the it's the result, it's the impact of of that thing that I think is ultimately most important. So check out U.S. Modernist Radio because you you get you know, like you said, the stories of the humans, the people, the architects, the homes, and, and the music is a fantastic touch to go along with this. A great soundtrack, literally. Oh, thank you. Speaking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where do you want to go? What we're we're you know, I'm, I'm sure you're planning this out years in advance, but where, what city have you not been to, but you want to go to? We've been to just about all the major centers at some point. Um, we are changing our tour structure somewhat, and then we're doing fewer tours every year. Um, we are, we go to Palm Springs every year. That's our biggest one. We take 40 people with us. We take over the entire 1963 mid-century hotel for the week. And take people on private tours and dinners and parties and a massage therapist by the pool and open bar and everything they could possibly want. We have one international trip a year. And then we're doing something called Moon Over Modernism uh, for a fundraiser for our capital campaign. And those are weekends in different cities. For on Saturday night, there's a fantastic party at a modernist house somewhere in the evening. And usually a large house. So the party's for 200, 250. And the next day, we go to a small house and take people through 30, 40 at a time. For instance, when we did this in LA, we were at the Stahl House, uh, one of the most famous ones in LA by Pierre Koenig. We had about 250 people go through in an afternoon, 25 at a time. So those events, we're going to try to do at least once a quarter. How do I uh, how do I sign up? The best way for people to to access any of this is through our newsletter, which comes out every Monday about nine twenty five a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you can go to usmarnis.org and sign up for the newsletter right there. What's what's this? What's the uh, story behind the specificity of nine twenty five a.m. Eastern? You know, uh, basically, it was because I was going to the gym and I got out at nine. <laughs> And I wanted to pick up a smoothie and I can make it home by 920. So I figured 925, that's the launch time for the newsletter on Monday morning. <laughs> Forever. <Yeah. laughs> Very good. Very good. That's great. Uh, I see John Jones says, speaking of music, you want to know the best music for uh, modernism. He said he's going with Brubeck. And, and you mentioned Brubeck. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that Dave Brubeck would get my vote. That'd be a good one. Yeah, you know, it, it's really cool when you, you walk in these houses that are like time capsules where you're really transported back to 1962 or 1954. But a lot of people ask me, do I have to do that? And you don't. It's absolutely not critical if you buy a mid-century modernist house to take it back to its original. Uh, our only request is don't screw it up because 20 years from now, you're going to sell it and that person's going to take it back to 1954. So, you know, our concern is just keeping people from doing something stupid with a house. Like if you take a perfectly fine modernist house and convert it into a Spanish villa, that's bad. That's very, very bad. Do not do that. Do not do that. Do you have guidelines? You know, say, you know, I know what a good scenario is, but let's just say that somebody in your, your family, maybe your aunt, owns a home, you know, a modernist home, and you don't know the future of that home beyond maybe her life. Maybe she doesn't have children. I don't know. I'm not, not sure. Is how her name Gladys? Plays. We're getting very specific here. It, it might be. It might be Aunt Gladys who didn't have any children. What do you need to do? What advice do you have for somebody, uh, somebody or somebody that knows somebody, you know, whatever, you said before, right? Bef before it, it gets to a certain point, you need to to develop a strategy, et cetera. What's how do you go about that? Well, if if a person or family really loves a house and wants to see it last and not get radically altered or torn down, there's only one legal way to do it in this country, and it's called a preservation easement. And basically, it's a homeowners association for one house. You draw it up yourself with an attorney 
It gets filed with the deed, just like a homeowners association does. And it puts regulations on how the house has to be cared for in the future. And this is like a volume knob on your hi-fi. You can turn it down as low or as high as you want. What most people do is just have basic protections. It says, A, if the house is damaged by a natural disaster, like a storm or an earthquake or trees falling on it or something, that there has to be a certain level of damage before you can tear it down. Like say half the building has to be beyond repair. And then the second rule generally is that if you're going to add on to the house, you have to do so in a similar manner to the original. So you can't just glom on a, a Cape Cod to the back of your modern because you're into Cape Cod that month. You have to make it similar. So this allows a lot of flexibility for people to, you know, update things like bathrooms and kitchens and technologies and things like that while keeping a consistent look and feel for the house. So that different versus defined addition is an interesting argument in preservation. And Europe takes a different stance than a lot of American cities yeah. where a lot of times preservation commissions want you to make it different so oh, yeah. that these are clearly different additions of different eras. And there's certain architectural tricks we do with that. Um, whereas in well, Europe, they're adults in Europe, yeah. you know, yeah. and they've had these things for a thousand years, not a hundred. This is true. This so is true. They want, they, want, they didn't want it to be different. Mm -hmm. But here, if your house was just built in 1954, don't stick something different, you know, onto the side of it. It's just, it's not like a cathedral or something else. Yeah. That, that's really the difference there between Europe and here is they've got a lot more history than we do. So many more layers, but it's yeah. helpful to hear it kind of how you're taking that. And you're specifically looking at residential properties yeah. instead. And a lot of times the preservation of those properties relies on people being able to live in them. And thankfully those open floor plans make that seemingly easier yes, for this next generation right now. They do. But you know, this applies, the preservation easement applies to any kind of architecture. If you have an old Victorian that you don't want to see destroyed, you know, walk, don't run to your local preservation association. And in every state, there are groups that do this. And you pay them a couple thousand dollars and they basically serve as the house police for the next 100 years. So they monitor the house. Um, they have to give permission if the owner wants to do some kind of change that is against the preservation easement. So when they put on an addition, they have to get it approved by that particular organization. But that's why most of these easements are designed to be pretty flexible. So you can basically just keep the house from being run over. Now you're dealing more with, um, not with architects, but everyday people, and they're finding your tours because they're interested in architects, but maybe Steve, Gladys's husband, is a little skeptical. So what do you uh, say to Steve? Oh, I love he's... this. Yes. <laughs> we have a lot of wayward spouses that come along on the trip that either uh, are indifferent to modernism or really dislike it. So the fact that they're going to be staying in some modernist places goes a long way because most have not, they don't understand like what it is to wake up and sort of feel how the house affects you. Having that initial cup of coffee in the morning when the light is streaming in from three sides of the house uh, is something they haven't experienced in their little tract home. Um, you know, these kinds of things really help persuade people to be more open to this kind of thinking. Um, also, when they see how other people are behaving in it. Modernist houses are great for entertainment. So they're great for parties. Uh, to go to a party in a modernist house, people are like, wow, this is really, you know, pretty sensational. Uh, so we, we have that situation a lot where one person likes it, one person, you know, doesn't necessarily. And then um, I think it's important just for people to, um, you know, look at what they want ultimately the house to do. Um, HGTV, which everyone watches, right, um, has one bad side effect in that they cause people to make lists of all the features they want in their house. So when they sit down for their first meeting with their architect and the architect says, what did you have in mind? They pull out their HGTV list of like 50 features that they want in the house, which immediately hamstrings the architect's creativity 
to do anything that might match the lifestyle of those people. So I advise the clients, it's like, don't make that list and don't go in there with that list because what the architect should do is ask, what do you want the house to do? Is it an entertainment space? Do you need to raise four kids? Does your mom, Gladys, need to move in with you in three years? Um, you know, do you need a performance space because one of you is a classical pianist? Um, do you have art where you need a studio? Do you have like a shop that you need in the basement? Um, do you have a, a motorboat you've been working on for eight years, you know, trying to put it together? I mean, those are the things the architect needs to know. They don't need to know that this year's hot color is turquoise. Another rousing endorsement <laughs> of HGTV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't, don't get me wrong. I love HGTV and they're great shows. But um, when it comes to actually engaging with architects, which you almost never see on HGTV, you see home designers and interior kinds of architects, but you don't see the people that are actually putting the buildings together from scratch. That would be a good show. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That... That's one of the common complaints from architects is that you don't see the, the, uh, the professional, you know, architectural professional, uh, depicted in the shows or even credited or referenced, et cetera. So no, architects have been like way out of popular culture. I mean, what do we have? Mm -hmm. We have Mr. Brady from the Brady bunch. He was the icon for years, right? We had Ted and how I met your mother. He was an architect in that show. But architects are few and far between in popular culture. Well, um, you know, maybe the best was Charles Bronson's character in Death Wish. Oh, yes, right. He was an architect, too. Yeah. <laughs> when, when they remade Death Wish, Bruce Willis played the Charles Bronson character, and he wasn't an architect anymore. That's when oh. he knew that architects had fallen out of favor. Yeah. You went from Death Wish to the remade Death Wish. You went from architect to surgeon. Surgeon. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you really want a fun, <laughs> if you really want a fun film, you should see Charles Bronson in Death Wish Five, the last horrible sequel. <laughs> it's good to have some alcohol when you see that because you'll need it to endure <laughs> it. And and Bronson just you know he just knows the formula and knocks them all out. <laughs> Christian says, "Countdown until they mention Jason Alexander." Art That's Vandelay. exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So in Seinfeld, you brought it up, Christian. George Costanza, uh, in order mostly to get women, uh, mm -hmm. comes up with an alter ego, Art Vandelay, who is an architect, That's right. and he thinks that that cachet will get him somewhere, and and it does temporarily mm -hmm. until people figure out he's not an architect. Yeah. yeah. He says, I always wanted to pretend to be an architect. And when he, he tells the woman, uh, I forget where they were, but he and Jerry were standing by the elevator. He gets introduced to this woman and he's, and, uh, well, what do you do? He says, I'm an architect. He says, oh, what have you designed? Well, have you seen the new addition to the Guggenheim? <laughs> oh, you did that? Yes. And it didn't take that long either. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't take that long either. Yeah, Charlie Guathme, who uh, actually did design that edition, would joke about that show all the time. <laughs> I'm sure. Funny. I'm sure. Well, before we logged off here, I wanted to bring attention to John Jones's question because acoustics is an aspect of a space that you can only experience kind of when you're in it. There's not too much literature about it. Um, there's the formal architectural documentation of acoustics, but he was asking, have you been pleasantly surprised or found that modernist architects paid serious attention to acoustics? Yes, um, acoustics, uh, they paid attention to green building before that was a thing, to energy efficiency before that was a thing. I mean, the whole mindset of modernists generally was, was very much about the future and it was incredibly optimistic. Um, about the time that modernism was approaching his zenith, a famous cartoon series came out called The Jetsons. And the Jetsons lived in these very modern quarters and had flying cars and robot maids and 
you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was, you know, it was a great place to live. And, and modernist architects use these elements of sight and sound and so forth to make homes and offices and buildings much more enjoyable. And they continue to do so today in large part. Uh, there's a hospital near you, Jeff, uh, Eskenazi Hospital, yeah, Eskenazi, yep, which yep. Uh, I visited about five years ago on our trip. And I thought I could live there. It is a fantastic building. And, and the patients just feel great going in there. And it has areas for, you know, the, the visitors to be that are very comfortable. And there's a rooftop garden that the patients can walk around and experience that. And they grow their own vegetables. It's like, I mean, sign me up for this hospital. Yeah, it's, it is really an amazing uh, project. So if you ever come to Indianapolis, let me know and I'll, I'll uh, take you by Eskenazi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and then we can go down to Columbus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, George, this has been fantastic. Um, let, me, let me make sure we pop the URL up in the, uh, on the screen there, usmodernist.org mm -hmm. is where you can find more about all the things that George is talking about. There are links to the podcast and to the tours and events and uh, the archives and everything uh, there at usmodernist.org. Uh, I, you know, listen, start by listening to the podcast. We're a little bit biased around here because that's essentially what we're, we're doing, but, um, but I think you'll really enjoy uh, the variety and, and also the storytelling and everything at uh, us modernist radio. Um, and then, sign up for a tour you're talking about this and i'm thinking you know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the the future a little bit here i may have to sign myself up for the uh, palm springs trip yeah. in, uh, in february so yeah come let us pay um, for you <laughs> it's, I, I'm, okay yeah. <laughs> i might have to do that all right well uh, again thank you thank yeah. you for being a repeat guest we really appreciate oh, you coming my back. honor really a, really a pleasure to talk with you again both of you Sounds like you're just oh, having a you. lot of fun with everything you're doing. I, oh, yeah. That's the secret. That's the secret to public involvement is you got to make it fun. Love yeah. It. You know, we at some point we ought to probably have you back and not even talk about, um, you know, everything that you're doing, but talk about following your passion. I think that would be a really fun conversation as well. So, okay. Um, Maybe we'll have to, uh, we'll book a third time here. Okay. Um, look forward to that. And, do I get a free blender uh, for all if I you, come on three times? You, you do. Okay. You do a free blender and you get a watch, but you have to put the watch in the blender. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the commercial. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Katie, as always, thank you for co-hosting with me here. And to all of you out there, thank you. And I say this every time and I mean this every single time. If it weren't for you, because we're, I didn't even look at the spreadsheet. We're a hundred and uh, about 140 of these interview episodes in. We ended the daily show at 730 episodes. Um, there's no way you'd show up just to hear me talk. So um, thank you for showing up and letting us know that you want to be here and you want to hear from people like George Smart. Uh, thank you for making Context and Clarity Live a thing. I appreciate it because it's in some way it is a very selfish endeavor because I get to have these conversations. So uh, thanks for making this a thing. We appreciate you. And as always, please be well, stay safe, keep those around you safe and well, find a little bit of time to breathe and relax, find some way to rejuvenate. We do this all the time. You've got to pace yourself and we'll see you back here again next week with another special guest on Context and Clarity Live next Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we'll see you then.